And you can turn in your Bibles to James chapter 3 for our New Testament reading. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting, it, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Thus far, the reading of God's word from the New Testament. Turn now to our Old Testament reading and sermon passage, Psalm 141. <laughs> o Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart incline to any evil to busy myself with wicked deeds in company with men who work iniquity, and let me not eat of their delicacies. Let a righteous man strike me, it is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Yet my prayer is continually against their evil deeds. When their judges are thrown over the cliff, then they shall hear my words, for they are pleasant. As when one plows and breaks up the earth, so shall our bones be scattered at the mouth of Sheol. But my eyes are toward you, O God, my Lord. In you I seek refuge. Leave me not defenseless. Keep me from the trap that they have laid for me and from the snares of evildoers. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass safely by. Join me in prayer. Oh Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes and ears to your word, that it would be made plain to us. We pray that we would be strengthened by it, encouraged, convicted. Lord, build us up into your church. Conform us into the image of your Son, by your Spirit. Lord, be present with us now. 
In the name of Christ, amen. You may remember the story of over a decade ago of the Chilean miners who were trapped down in that mine for 69 days. Can you imagine being stuck in such a terrible condition? I get claustrophobic going in too small of a room, and these men, 33, were stuck down in this mine for over two months. If you imagine what you would be feeling, if you could imagine what would you shout out if you thought somebody could hear you or pass by, what, are, what would you want to convey? You would cry out, help, I'm stuck. Throw down a rope. You'd, can you toss me a stick of deodorant? Uh, maybe not that, that last one. But what are we hearing here from the psalmist? We see that he's in dire straits, that there's traps all around him, that death may be imminent, that there is evil around him. And yet his first big request, after saying, hear me, may my prayers be pleasant to you, his first big request is, let let my prayer be like a sweet-smelling incense to you. May my, my request to you be pleasing. Don't let me be an odorous stench before you. Set a guard over my mouth so that even, all, even though there's evil all around me, there's danger all around me, and bad things are imminent, help me to do what is right. Preserve me, deliver me from the influence of evil upon me. This is David's prayer to the Lord. He prays for both deliverance, but first he prays that he would do right. This mirrors the condition of the entire world. Evil is all around us, both moral and situational evil. Disaster, calamity, danger, suffering, and death. Evil, even inside our own hearts. Our only salvation is to go to the God who is a consuming fire the Holy One before whom no man can stand. Doesn't that sound like going from the frying pan to the fire? To escape the dangers of evil within and around us, we have to come face to face with the judge of the world. And it won't be better for us if we are found wanting. And so, David's first request, as he's opening this, he says, Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. These are two things that occurred in temple worship, that a sacrifice would be made for atonement. And incense would be burned. It was called a sweet smell to the Lord. What does it mean for our prayers and our lifted up hands in prayer to be counted as incense and sacrifice? We can think of them as doing two different things. First of all, there's plenty of scripture that talks about how the incense is a sweet smell, something that is pleasant for the Lord, something that he enjoys, something, and there are sacrifices that please the Lord. So these are things that are, are, are not just something that are compulsory, not just things that we check off, but things that bring joy to God. But secondly, there is an aspect of protection.
In Numbers 16, Aaron runs out among the people. Well, actually, let me start with this. It, the high priest goes in to the Holy of Holies once a year, and the text says that he must bring the incense with him lest he die. So you have this high priest going into this holy place, and he has this smoke coming up from this incense and this billowing cloud of protection. Because if he does not have that cloud around him, he will die. In that instance, that incense is his protection as he is going in there. And there is the instance in number 16 when there is a plague coming on the people of Israel. And Aaron is told to run out to the people, take the incense out of that inner place and take it out to the people and run among the people that the incense would be among them and stop the plague. That the incense would be a protection to the people of God there. In the same way, the sacrifice is not only something that is done for pleasing the Lord, but it is something that is given for the sake of our sins. Something that is given to actually protect us from judgment, just judgment. The animals sacrificed, we know from Hebrews 10, are, we know that the blood of bulls and goats never wiped away any true sins, but it was accounted as doing so. God told Israel to do it. Do this for, their, for your sins. And so this entire time he's telling them to write this check, write a billion dollar check to me. Now, if you write one billion dollars on a check, is that check worth a billion dollars? Not if it's on one of my checks. <laughs> Yet, the check lay on the desk year after year after year. And at the right time, God made a deposit himself by his own son into that bank so that when it was needed to be cashed, it wasn't just accounted on paper as having been paid, but truly, actually paid. There was actual funds in the account, and it was paid for, truly. And so we can look back on this as New Testament Christians and say, may my uplifted hands be as a sacrifice. That is, don't look on me and see me. Look on me and see the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Why are we spending so much time on incense and sacrifice? It can be easy going into prayer to think of it as an obligation. Have you ever said, well, I know I should pray more? Have you ever thought, like, well, okay, well, I guess I should go to the prayer night? That sort of compulsory feeling that you know you ought to do it because you need to check this box and you need to make sure that God is check checking this box for you. But when you pray to God, it is, a, it is described as being incense. A beautiful smell to the Lord. Revelation 5, 8, we read, and when the scroll, when he had taken the scroll, speaking of the Lamb, as he goes into open the scrolls, it says, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the Lamb, each holding a harp, and the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. That image there is that the incense bowl being presented there in the kingdom of heaven, the smoke that is going up, that sweet smell that is pleasing to the Lord is the prayer of the saints. So when you are praying to the Lord, 
he's not up there looking down with a straight face thinking, okay, all right, check. You've done your duty today. Come back tomorrow. When we go to the Lord in prayer, there's a sweet-smelling incense, something that he enjoys, something that brings him pleasure. Why should we pray to a sovereign Lord? Why should we pray to God? Because we have to, because we should. Because it is a sweet-smelling incense to him. Because it brings him joy. And secondly, it's described as showing protection. That the prayers of the saints would be a protection for ourselves and for those that we pray for. The sovereign God who chooses to act on the prayers of his people. This also describes the shape of the rest of the psalm. Let me be pleasing to you like a sweet-smelling incense, but also please protect me. I need your protection. Incense and sacrifice. Verses 3 and 4. We see David requesting that I be pleasing to you. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart incline to any evil to busy myself with wicked deeds in the company with men who work iniquity, and let me not eat of their delicacies. There's a twofold application here when he says, Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. The plain meaning in first application is we don't want something to come out that shouldn't come out. Don't let me say something evil and wicked. And we see that mirrored afterwards when it says, do not let my my heart incline to any evil. As Christ said, it is out of the wellspring of the heart that the mouth speaks. Don't let my heart be so full of evil that it pours out of my mouth. But then we see further down in the same verse, and let me not eat of their delicacies. Spending all this time with wicked men who do wicked things, who cheat, lie, kill, to gain advantage, to gain wealth, to gain benefits, don't let me eat of those benefits. Don't let me partake in that. Don't guard my mouth so that those Pleasant-looking things don't cross my lips. I do not want to partake in those things and thus be stained by the wickedness that produced it. In the first instance, guard my mouth lest something evil come out. This regards speech, but it's also seen to be much broader. Because he says, don't let my heart be inclined to any sort of evil. So there's an image of things coming out of our mouth and things coming into our mouth. But the overall prayer is that I don't produce evil and that I don't receive the benefits of evil either. And so do not let me do evil things in general. Keep me from it. But this is an apt overall image because of what James says about the tongue, that if any man can keep control of that, he can control anything. If you can control what you say, that is the hardest thing. That is just the hardest thing to do. And so that's the prayer, the first prayer, the representative prayer is guard my mouth lest something evil come out of it. Let me ask you, 
When are you most fiercely tempted to speak in a wicked way? For me, it's when I'm sinned against. If somebody sins against me, then I have a righteous right to say something right back. I have a, a, a reason to, to just be mean in my words because you did something wrong and I can prove it and so it doesn't matter what I say in response to that. Yes, it does. Lord, there's evil all around me. Bad things are happening to me. Guard my mouth. Do not let me respond in the way that I tend to respond. We heard from James that we bless our Lord and Father with the same mouth as we curse man who's made in his image. Let it not be so. Let it not be so that we respond in this way. We see in his prayer, as he broadens this out in verse 4, do not let my heart incline to any evil, to busy myself with wicked deeds and company with men who work iniquity. He broadens it out to not just how I speak, but what do I do in response. Don't let me act viciously in response to viciousness. Do not let me act in any way. Although the representative image is speech, because that is the hardest part. The converse is guard my mouth lest something evil go in. And we see that this is not a publican prayer, thank you that I'm not like these people. I'm so different and righteous, please let it be shown and known that I am better than all these wicked people around me who are doing wicked things. But rather, that looks really good to me. Please keep me from it. I would be like them if you do not keep me from it. He prays, do not let me eat of their delicacies. He says, the word here is pleasant things, the word for pleasant here. And so the idea of delicacies is a good translation. It's something very tasty, good to eat, the pleasant things. Don't let me eat of their pleasant things. Because we know where they have come from. They have come from cheating, stealing. They have come from murder and deceit. Do not let me benefit from them. They come from falsehood. If you're in high school or any school really and you have your friends and they have a certain way of speaking and it looks different, has looked different across generations and it's going to look different from school to school, but there's a certain way of speaking that somebody can say something that you know is wrong and bad, but they get a pat on the back about it. They get laughs, they get social respect. There, there are things that, that uh, are just repeated and repeated and repeated, whether it's through bullying and things like that, which is probably more in my generation or this generation where it's kind of just reiterating uh, um, whatever is the current right and perfect thing which is not aligned with how God says things ought to be. And you know it. You know it's wrong, but you see all of the respect that they get, 
and all of the honor that they get, and that they said that thing and they're lifted up. Now, if I just say what they say, if I affirm what they affirm, if I treat people how they treat people, I can have that same benefit. I can have those same friends. I can have that same praise. I can eat of those delicacies, of those pleasant things. Let it not be so. Guard, set a guard before my mouth. Let me not eat of their delicacies. That is, go in their own way, in their way, compromise what I know is true, what I know is right, what I know is loving. This also reminds me a little bit of The Godfather. If you've never seen it, you're surely familiar with the uh, idea of I'll do you a favor now. But then, you know, sometime in the future, I don't know when, I will require a favor from you. And so somebody comes to this mob boss in need. I need this thing. I want this thing. And this mob boss who gets all of this wealth and power through nefarious means and wickedness says, yeah, I'll give you a pleasant thing. I'll let you eat of my delicacies. But you know what? It doesn't stop there. The relationship isn't over there. It is going to come back because then something will be required of you to contribute to that system of unrighteousness and wickedness in some way. That you will be part of it and fulfill it in some way. You don't get to participate and just take a nice thing from, the, from uh, somebody's wicked gains and then just not be part of it, but rather we get sucked in. David's first prayer set a guard over my, oh Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. We see in verses five through seven David reiterating this point. I want this so much that I want you to send a righteous man to smack me upside the head if you need. Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Yet my prayer is continually against their evil deeds. When their judges are thrown over the cliff, then they shall hear my words, for they are pleasant. And when one plows and breaks up the earth, so shall our bones be scattered at the mouth of Sheol. Verses 6 and 7 here are very, very hard to understand. The Hebrew is just extremely difficult and it's not just that people disagree on what it means, it's that we all agree that it's very hard to understand. Um, but in the context, the general sense seems to be, let a righteous man correct me, even if it's unpleasant, it is pleasantness to me that he would smack me upside the head, that he would give me a rebuke to my face. And then, to the correlate, to those who are doing wicked, that my action and response would be when their judges are thrown over the cliff, that is, the leaders and those responsible are brought to their demise, that those other wicked people would hear my words either spoken in the past or now in response, in reflection, that they are pleasant. It says, for then they shall hear my words, for they are pleasant. 
That's the same word that he uses uh, when he talks about, don't let me eat of their delicacies, don't let me eat of their pleasant things. They think that what they have is pleasant and that my rebuke to them and my correction to them is unpleasant. But when judgment is coming and evident, they'll see that my correction of them is a pleasant thing. This is the true delicacy. This is the true thing to be desired. May that also be our prayer, that we would not be so confident in our own self, our own ability to do exactly the right thing, but that we would welcome correction. I'm really preaching to myself there, because I, I, like, this anxious knot in my stomach when I get correction, and I need it. I need it all the time. And I know it's good for me. And so you can pray that for yourself and you can pray it for me. Send a righteous man to correct me and let my head not refuse it because it is a soothing balm, an oil to my head that repairs damage that's there, that protects me. And let me not keep my mouth closed when calamity is coming coming for those who would be in judgment. Let my words be proved to be pleasant for them. Even though if I give them the truth, and they think, that is bitter nonsense. That is hate speech. That, you, you hate me and who and what I am. No, 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 no. Please hear my words. And Lord, may it be evident to them that my words are pleasant, that my words, too, are an anointing oil meant to heal, not harm. After this prayer for becoming incense, as his prayer would be, to be sweet-smelling before the Lord, David prays, But my eyes are toward you, O my God, O God, my Lord. In you I seek refuge. Leave me not defenseless. Keep me from the trap that they have laid for me and from the snares of evildoers. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass safely by. It is difficult to read this and not think about Christ because Christ had traps laid out for him, snares set by evildoers. And that phrase there that you see, leave me not defenseless, there's a little, if you're reading in the Pew Bible, there's a little number two on there and it goes all the way down and you can see it says, the Hebrew says, do not pour out my life. That's what is literally being said there, but a more easy to understand phrasing is, leave me not defenseless. Do not pour out my life. That is New Testament language for what Jesus has done for us that his life was poured out for us. His lifeblood shed for us. That the snares and traps of the devil and Judas 
were set. Yet Christ was not spared them. But for our benefit, we are spared the trap. We are spared being poured out because Christ himself purposefully walked into the trap knowing it is there and had his life poured out in place of us. We see here a perfect prayer for us to offer up to the Lord and an understanding that he has already answered it in the biggest sense possible through Jesus Christ. We have been preserved from the trap because Christ had walked into it for us. It is because of his work on the cross that our prayers can be a sweet-smelling incense. That we can stand before God as an appealing sacrifice. Not because of how well we guard our mouths, though we should follow Christ in that. Though that ought to be our heart's prayer and our drive. But we're sweet-smelling and pleasant before the Lord because of the work that Jesus Christ has done. But all the times that you did say the wicked thing, that you did eat of the delicacy, has been wiped away. It is gone as far as the east is from the west because of the work of Christ. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. That though you are a holy, consuming fire, that your glory is too bright for us to enter into. You sent your son to walk into the snare of the devil. That he poured out his life on our behalf. that his righteousness has become ours. Lord, call us ever forward. Set a guard over our mouths. Hear our prayers. And may they be sweet incense to you. See our outstretched hands in prayer. And Lord, only see your son in his righteousness. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.